So Zach, why don't we uh, why don't we get started? Before, All right. Before we dig into the scripture, this is the Isolation Bible Study, and uh, I'm Bill Tucker. Zach McIntosh is with us, and we're going to dig in, as he mentioned, dig into Psalm 42. Before we do that, I want to remind you of a couple things. Number one, uh, please, if you have little ones or grandkids, our Vacation Bible School is going to be all online, and it really is going to be awesome. They've been recording it and uh, putting just so much time and effort into it. It's going to be amazing. Now, you've got to register. You may say, well, if it's online, what difference does it make? Well, you want to make sure you have the things you need because they're simple crafts, they're simple snacks, but they all fit into the theme. So we want you to have the supply list so you make sure you have what you need. So register at concordia.cc. That's our website. Go to www.concordia.cc and you'll see the It'll be in the big banner about Vacation Bible School. You'll be able to register and get the kids plugged in because it's going to be a really fun week. It's going to be a blast. You know, Zach, one of the other things that I've been talking with some other pastors about is sharing our VBS with, with their congregations and, and theirs with us. So that, you know, so for example, the week after ours finishes, the folks at St. John in Orange, California are doing their Vacation Bible School. I know they'll do a great job. And so we'll share those links and help folks get registered so they can be part of that experience with them. And just give kids, if, if parents choose, give kids things to do to, to have some fun and continue growing in their faith throughout the summer. Yeah, because we don't know when a lot of places are going to be opening up again. And some are beginning to open up. Others aren't. And so any extra resources that we can help parents out with, um, hopefully that will be helpful to parents as they seek to find good stuff for their kids to do this summer. Yep, it's going to be uh, it's going to be make the best of it and uh, figure out how to do something new. Sounds like a theme from our message this weekend, doesn't it? Hey, we're talking about that this weekend. Which, by the way, uh, we'd love to have you join us for worship this weekend. We're we're online only again this weekend, or that's we're thinking about it or talking about it, and so uh, should be should be a good weekend. Join us, and uh, should be a a fun weekend. Yeah, we're online only this weekend. We're getting really close. In fact. I'll be putting out a video and you'll get some more information sort of talking about the timeline, but we're getting closer and closer. Uh, but uh, again, I'm really proud of our, of our worship team and our production team and all of the work that they've done to make that online worship experience tremendous. Uh, yeah. Great job. And they're working hard. So, well, Zach, let's, let's dig in. Let me pray. And then if you'll uh, lead us through Psalm 42, that'd be awesome. All right. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day, for the chance we have to uh, gather together in this way around your word electronically. Lord, bless our time and allow that word by the power of your spirit to sink deeply into our hearts and minds that we might grow in our faith and uh, walk with you more closely. And so we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So Psalm 42 is where we are today. And this psalm actually has a few really famous lines in it. Uh, but they're also really profound. And so uh, we'll start with what we've been starting with for a lot of these different psalms, which is a lot of these psalms have a superscription. And a superscription is that little thing that's right under what says Psalm 42, but it's before Psalm 42, verse 1. And it just gives us a little bit of context for uh, what the psalm was for and maybe who it was written by or who it was sung by. And so the superscription says it's for the director of music. It's a maskil, and we'll talk about what that is, of the sons of Korah. Now, let's actually start with the end of the superscription first, uh, the sons of Korah. We actually talked about this a couple of weeks ago when we were talking about uh, Psalm 46. The sons of Korah were a very famous choir in ancient Israel. Uh, we actually read about them in 2 Chronicles 20, verse 19. Uh, it talks about some, some Levites from the Korah Heights. They stood up and they praised the Lord, the God of Israel, uh, with a very loud voice. And the Hebrew there more woodenly reads with a great high voice. And so one of the things that scholars have debated over for a long time is whether or not that was high in volume or high in pitch. And so it could be that these guys really did have a really good falsetto. And yet they sang these big, great songs about God. And that actually leads us to what a maskil is. Some of these musical terms, uh, scholars debate over how, how to translate them. But probably the most popular way to think of a maskil is it's a song of, of wisdom. And so these guys with these little high voices are actually going to give us very wise words in this song. <laughs> okay. uh, I'm not sure that it was because they sang in falsetto. I'm just, that's, I'm not convinced of that, Zach, but 
let's go with it and dig into Psalm 42. Well, that's that's one of the cool things about songs, right? Uh, what what matters most, right, is, is not whether your voice is high or low, or not when you sing them or how you sing them, but but the content that they convey and carry. And this song conveys amazing content about who God is and how we can find our hope. In now, speaking him. of songs that are that are sung at a very high pitch, the first dance at our wedding was to the song "When I'm With You" by Sheriff. Oh wow. It, it is not filled with substance, I'll, I'll tell you that much, but it is sung at a very high pitch. If you know that song, you know, awesome. If you don't, you can find it on, on the Internet. Sheriff was a one-hit wonder, but uh, it has nothing to do with Psalm 42. Sorry, Jack. Made a memory that lasts forever. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Psalm 42, uh, beginning at verse 1. As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When can I go and meet with God? Uh, let's start here. Uh, so the psalmist starts with this picture, right? There's this deer who's panting for streams of water. Now, uh, if you have a dog, I know you have a dog, I have a dog. When we think of panting, we think of something that, you know, dogs do, and it's not a really big deal. But, but in this cultural context, panting would have been a huge deal. In fact, this, this word for panting, it pops up one other time in the Old Testament, and it's from a, a prophet. His name is Joel, and this is in Joel chapter 1. And here's what Joel's talking about. He's talking about this, this significant and dangerous and actually deadly drought. And so in Joel 1 verse 16, he says, Has not the food been cut off before our very eyes, joy and gladness from the house of our God. The seeds are shriveled beneath the clods, the storehouses, what they would use to store grain. Those are all in ruins. The granaries, they've been broken down. The grain is dried up. And this has gotten so bad that now the animals are suffering. So verse 18, how the cattle moan, the herds mill about because they have no pasture. The flocks of sheep are suffering. And then verse 20, even the wild animals, and here's the one other time in the Old Testament this word pant pops up. Even the wild animals pant for you because the streams of water have dried up and then fires. So now, you know, everything's dry. So you get these essentially forest fires have devoured the pastures in the wilderness. And, and so the idea in Psalm 42, it, it, it's not your dog. The idea is that you are feeling so spiritually parched and so spiritually thirsty that, that you are spiritually dehydrated and you kind of feel, you kind of feel like you're on the edge of spiritual death. And so the idea is the psalmist finds himself in, in, in a very tough situation. Yeah, you know, the, I, I think the, you know, when I, so we take our dog on a walk and the reality is he pants, but I, I believe that's about him regulating his temperature because he doesn't perspire the way we do. He's regulating his temperature and so he starts, he starts panting harder. You try to give him water. He's not thirsty. He doesn't want water. That's not what's going on at all. This is a whole different, this is a deathly circumstance of extreme dehydration. They're longing for this desperately. And so the psalmist paints this picture, right? And they, they would have kind of known this because they were familiar with droughts. You know, we turn on the tap. They didn't have the tap. If the wells dried up, you were done. And so as the deer pants for streams of water, the psalmist continues, so my soul pants for you, my God. Now, uh, let's say a word about that word soul. We talked about this actually several months ago. We did a series called Soul Keeping. And, and here's kind of the, the popular version of what your soul is. It's the spiritual, immaterial, ethereal uh, part of you that actually isn't what the psalmist is talking about. Um, in the Old Testament, the soul is basically you. All of you, uh, the, the spiritual part, the, the, the physical part. Uh, one of the verses that we used in that series, Psalm 130, verse 5, I wait for the Lord, my whole being waits. And that little phrase, my whole being, that's the old Hebrew word for, for soul. And so we're all integrated. In fact, if you, if you go down um, a little bit in Psalm 42 to verse 10, the psalmist says, okay, here's what it feels like for my soul to be panting. My bones, now that's very physical. My bones suffer mortal agony as I have a foe that taunts me. And so we talked about this a couple of weeks ago. We're, we're a psychosomatic being. In other words, we're all of, of one piece. What happens in your soul affects your body. What happens in your body affects your soul. 
you know, Zach, we use the soul keeping series in Ethiopia and uh, Tim Runch and I had the privilege of leading a retreat for the leadership of the Makani Jesus church, the Lutheran church body in Ethiopia. And I remember what kind of a revelation it was to realize that the soul was everything about us. And, and it was the same for them. And to realize that, that anything that we allow or anything that we do that damages a part of our body, whether it's our physical body, our emotional body, our intellectual being, uh, all of that impacts our soul, uh, spirit, body, mind, all of that. And so that's what you're talking about, that, that, that our, our whole being longs for the Lord. Now, here's the spiritual problem that the psalmist is having. There's one other thing I want you to notice about verses 1 and 2. So back to verse 1, as the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you. And then the psalmist says, my God. My soul thirsts for God, the living God. Where can I go and meet with God? So this is a psalm about God, and we just kind of gloss over that, and we go, okay, yeah, most of the psalms are about God. But, but this is important. Because the psalmist calls God, God, and he doesn't use the personal name for God. A lot of times you'll see this translated in the Old Testament as the word Lord in all caps, L-O-R-D in all caps. And that's, that's uh, in Hebrew, that, that's the name of God, Yahweh. And, and so the psalmist is simply talking about God, but he's not really talking to God personally. Now, there's a reason this is important, and it actually comes out beautifully if you take a look at two psalms. Uh, the first is Psalm 14, okay, where the psalmist says there's a fool who says in his heart there is no God. And those folks are corrupt, their deeds are vile, there is no one who does good. And then in verse 2, the psalmist continues and he says, Now the Lord, that's the personal name for God, Yahweh, looks down from heaven on all mankind to see if there are any who understand, any who seek God. Do all these evildoers know nothing? Uh, they devour God's people as though eating bread. They never call on the Lord. You evildoers frustrate the plans of the poor, but the Lord is their refuge. Oh, that salvation for Israel would come out of Zion when the Lord restores his people. Now, that, that's Psalm 14. Just kind of hang with me here and skip forward to Psalm 53. Now, Psalm 53 is the same as Psalm 14, with an important exception. The fool says in his heart, this is Psalm 53, there's no God. See, this is the same thing. These people are corrupt, their ways are vile, there's no one who does good. But then notice verse 2. The psalmist doesn't say the Lord, he says, well, God looks down from heaven and sees all mankind. Or verse 5, God scatters the bones of those who attack you. God despises them. Verse 6, oh, that salvation for Israel would come out of Zion when God restores his people. And so in Psalm 14, notice the psalmist, he's talking about people who don't believe in God, but he himself feels very close to God. He uses the personal name of God. He calls him the Lord. In Psalm 53, the psalmist is almost right there with those people who are wondering, is there a God? Because now he's not talking to God personally. He's just using a generic name for God. Now, in Psalm 42, we get a generic name for God, which means that this psalmist is in a spiritual crisis where he's not feeling close to God. He's talking about God generically, but he's not talking about God personally. Now, here's why this is so important. This is just a common human experience. But, but here's the key. Even when you feel a little separated from God, you don't have to go so far as to say there is no God. You can have questions about God. You can have doubts about God. You can struggle with God. You can wonder, God, are you there? But even when you're struggling with that, like the psalmist is in Psalm 53, he still knows that you don't have to say there is no God. You don't have to give up altogether spiritually. That's hugely important. You know, it's interesting, Zach, I've talked to lots and lots of folks, including some folks very close to me, who have been in this desperate sort of soul needs the Lord panting kind of a circumstance. And that's exactly the encouragement that I've given them is, even though you have doubts, even though you're struggling with, with the reality of God or your relationship with God, don't surrender. 
don't simply sort of throw up your hands and say, I give up, there is no God. I read an article just yesterday about a, a, a Christian musician and a pastor's son who has fallen away from his faith and son. renounced his walk with Jesus. And I, I just thought to myself, what a, what a tragedy. Because the, the thing is, all of us go through spiritually dry times. All of us can get parched like this because that's what that's what life and trials and struggles and 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 the devil loves to have happen our own sinful nature but when we when we stay in god's word when we continue to be around god's people there's a refreshment that comes from the holy spirit sometimes it takes a long time Uh, but but that temptation to just sort of get it over with and, and renounce our faith is such a tragic mistake because our God is faithful, and he doesn't abandon us. So if God feels distant and generic, you know what? Just live with that tension. The, the psalmist did, and, and golly, struggle through it. And by the way, if you need help, ask for help. You don't have to walk alone. You don't have to be ashamed to admit that you have doubts or questions. That's, that's part of what we want to be a safe place for at Concordia. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so here's the psalmist, right? And he starts by saying, okay, so the deer is dehydrated. He's panting for streams of water. I'm spiritually dehydrated, right? I'm talking about God kind of generically and generally. (laughs) And I need water. And then notice the psalmist finds his water. (laughs) But it's not very good. Psalm 42, verse 3, my tears. My tears have been what I've been eating. They've been my food day and night. Well, people are basically taunting me in my crisis of faith. They're saying to me all day long, where is your God? My goodness. Um, This is a tough spot for the psalmist to be in. Now he continues in verse 4, These things I remember as I pour out my soul. How I used to go (laughs) to the house of God under the protection of the mighty one with shouts of joy and praise among the festive throng. So so just to make sure we're not missing what the psalmist is saying here, this is part of the reason I love this psalm for this time. The psalmist is saying, you know, I remember a time in my faith life when I could go to church and I'd be with a festive throng and we'd be singing together, all right? And we'd be shouting for joy. We'd be praising God. We'd be together as the body of God. And now all of a sudden, I've been separated from that. I can't get together with the festive throng anymore. I used to be able to go to the house of God, but now I can't go anymore. And, and it's, it's killing me kind of spiritually. I feel so separated and, and isolated and, and alone. Does any of this sound familiar? Yeah, more than a little bit. And, and so here's here's kind of what I want you to take away. Um, so the psalmist talks about in verse 4 this, this festive throng, right? He used to be able to be together with all these other people and sing. Now, now the Hebrew word behind this word festive throng is the word sock. Okay, so think S-A-K. All right, now it's it's the verbal form of this same word in Hebrew is sakak, so S-A-K-A-K. And, and so festive throng means like a group of people. The verb means something that you weave together. And so the idea is, right, when you're among a bunch of people, you're all kind of woven together, you're intermingling in and among each other. Well, the verbal form of this same word is actually used in another psalm. Psalm 139, where the psalmist says to God, uh, You created, O God, my inmost being, and you knit me together. You sakakked me in my mother's womb. I praise you, because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. So, here's, here's what I want folks to keep in mind. Um, when you can't be together with the festive throng, just remember that even just as you You've been woven together. You're like a festive throng to God because he has made you fearfully and wonderfully. And if nothing else, you can praise God for that. You know, it's interesting, Zach, how I think in this time we've discovered how worship isn't just something that happens in a particular place or with a particular group of people that worship really is about is about 
us and our relationship with God. And what a blessing to be able to facilitate that worship through online services. But even that's not necessary. That that, that, that idea of worshiping God and praising God is something that, that can and should happen purely out of the fact that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. We praise the one who made us and created us. Yeah, so it's so here's here's kind of we need these psalms at different times, right? So Psalm 42, right? If you kind of live with this idea that it's just me and God and golly, I don't need to be accountable to anybody, I never need to talk to anybody, I never need to worship with anybody, the psalmist would say, "You know what? The festive throng should be something that you yearn for. You, you ought to look for that." But but if you are really struggling during this time and you're going, I, I can't see anybody, I'm isolated, right? Um, and uh, I just need to be in public again, then you need Psalm 139, which, which reminds you that there is a very personal part of your relationship with God. And, and just because you're not around anybody doesn't mean that God has forsaken you or abandoned you. And, and you know what? Your personal faith is still your personal faith, and it can be an incredible blessing to you. So we need both sides. Absolutely, we do. Verse 5, the psalmist continues. So, he's not doing very well, right? He's kind of ready to go back to church. He's feeling isolated, ostracized. He has people around him who are kind of taunting him because of his faith. And so, here's what he does. Verse 5, uh, why, my soul, are you downcast? Why are you so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. So here's, here's what the psalmist does, okay? There are really two different things that you can do when you're feeling really downcast. A, you can follow your heart. In other words, if you're feeling bad about something that's going on in a relationship, just follow your heart into a new relationship. Or if you're feeling bad about something that's going on in your job, just follow your heart into a new job. If you feel bad about anything in life, just follow your heart into new something. Now, let's just be honest. That's a recipe for disaster. It's a recipe for disaster. <laughs> You're never going to find a good job. You're never going to be in a good relationship that way. Just, just, just following your heart, uh, your heart can deceive you. The prophet Jeremiah is actually very clear about this. So the psalmist actually takes the opposite tact. Instead of following his heart, he actually talks to his heart or he talks to his soul. And he says, hey, uh, soul, what's the matter? Why are you so downcast? What's going on? on. We, we, we got to talk about this because this is not going to work. And, and notice he takes it even further. So he talks to his soul once and the soul seems to be a little silent. <laughs> and so what does he do? He just keeps on talking to his soul. Very next verse, Psalm 42, verse 6, my soul is downcast within me. Therefore, I will remember you from the land of the Jordan, the heights of Hermon, from Mount Miser. And, and so I don't know if you've had this experience. I, I know I've had it where I've had to kind of talk to myself in circles before I get clarity on something. That's exactly what the psalmist is doing here. Nick, when I, when I read this, what, what comes into my mind is 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, where it talks about rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances. This is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. That those are those are things, those are decisions we make in the face of anything and everything to turn to God. That there's a discipline about rejoicing. There's a discipline about praying. There's a discipline about giving thanks. It's not based on the emotional circumstance. It's a choice we make that leads to experiencing that refreshment from God. And so here's where the psalmist is, okay? He says he's at the heights of Hermon from Mount Miser, which is, by the way, about a, uh, as the crow flies, about 100 miles away from, from Jerusalem. And by foot, this would have been even further because you would have had to go around the Sea of Galilee and all sorts of stuff. And so here's the idea. Uh, the psalmist is, is a long way from, from home. He's a long way from his home base, from his hometown, from everything that he knows. And so he feels separated from everyone that he knows. He doesn't have his festive throng. And he feels kind of separated from God because bad things are happening to him. And this is why he continues in verse 7, deep calls to deep in the roar of your waterfalls. All your waves and breakers 
have swept over me. Now, there's actually a song that's out that says, your love is like a waterfall, waterfall. And it's all about how great God's love is and how refreshing it is. Uh, that's, that's, that's all true, but that's actually not what the psalmist is saying here. Um, he's not talking about being refreshing. At the same time he's panting, he also kind of feels like he's, like he's drowning, like he can't keep his head above water. In fact, if you just skip ahead a couple of verses to verses 9 and 10, the psalmist makes this very clear when he says, I, I say to my God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why must I go about mourning, oppressed by the enemy, and my bones are suffering mortal agony, my foes are taunting to me, and they're saying to me all day long, where is your God? That's, that's kind of the experience that the psalmist is having when he talks about how he's in the middle of the roar of a waterfall. Okay, This is the guy who feels like he's being pushed over Niagara in a barrel, and it doesn't feel good. But... There's verse 8. And we skipped over it, but we got to go back to it. Because notice what the psalmist does. Psalm 42, verse 8. By day, the who? Not just God. The Lord directs his love. At night, his song is with me. A prayer to the God of my life. And so here's what the psalmist has done. He's talked to himself, and he's talked to his soul, and he's talked about how he's dehydrated, and he's talked about how he feels like he's drowning all at the same time. And then he, he, he finally has this epiphany where he can begin to talk to God personally. And what does he talk to God about? His love. Because God's love for us is always personal. Personal and without limit. Yeah. And so the last verse of Psalm 42, this is kind of cool. Um, the psalmist says, why, my soul, are you downcast? Why are you so disturbed within me? He's still talking to himself. He's still having this conversation, right? Put your hope in God, for will I yet praise him, my Savior and my God. Now, here's what I want you to pick up on. This is, this is the same thing as verse 5 with one notable exception. Uh, when the psalmist talks about his Savior and his God, uh, the word translated as this phrase, my Savior, uh, woodenly from the Hebrew, it means the salvation, okay, that is from the face of God. Because a lot of times this is the way the ancients thought about God. This is why in the blessing that we say at the end of the service, we talk about uh, asking God to make his face shine upon us. And so in verse 5, he says, okay, I have a Savior and a God, and there is salvation that is coming from his face. Now, in verse 11, he changes the Hebrew just a little bit uh, from verse 5. In verse 5, it's the salvation that's coming from God's face. And in verse 11, he changes it to the salvation that comes to my face. And so here's the idea. Between verse 5 and verse 11, God's salvation has made it to the psalmist. From God's face to his face. And it doesn't mean that he feels all the way better, but it does mean that he feels just a little better because he's taken the time to talk to his soul. And God has been faithful to answer. Awesome. Awesome. I love the picture face to face. But that brings that brings him back. That conversation with his soul and that choice, that discipline to talk to his soul and, and remind him of God's love brings him right back face to face. Beautiful picture. Anything else, Zach? I think that's Psalm 42. Um, I guess we could do the, 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 one, the, the one more thing, right? Notice that the psalm is all um, singular, right? The psalmist is talking about my soul and my God and my Savior. But if you go all the way back to the superscription, it's sung by what? A choir. And so it's sung by more than one person. And so here's just, just the idea. When you feel like you're all alone, when you feel like your soul is panting, when you feel like you're drowning, uh, just remember, eventually your experience becomes an experience that can be sung by a whole choir. It becomes a community experience because isolation never lasts forever. And what you're going through right now could be a benefit to a whole choir full of people later. Excellent point. Love finishing on 
It will only last for, for a time. It's a season and the season will end. Well, dear friends, thanks for joining us for Isolation Bible Study. We'll be back with you on Friday. And uh, right now, let's finish up with a word of prayer. Lord, I thank you for this time together. I thank you for those who have been a part electronically. I thank you for Pastor Zach and his wisdom and understanding. And I pray that you'll bless us for this time in your word, that we would learn to speak to our souls, even in those dark times, even in those desperate times of spiritual parchedness. And Lord, draw us back to yourself, uh, face to face, to remember your love and receive the joy of salvation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you, everybody. Hope you have a great day.